Hello and welcome to The Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of The Doc Podcast. We received such a great response to the two-part series we recorded a couple months ago with Dr. Stacy Ochoa and myself that we decided to uh, sit down and chat some more and, and get back together to discuss this very important issue of airway orthodontics, especially as it pertains to the treatment of pediatric patients. Since we last spoke, a number of things have happened um, with both Stacy and myself. Uh, she attended the Winds of Change meeting in St. Louis last weekend. I, I really want to pick her brain about that. I've heard great things about it, and she was a speaker at that meeting. Uh, so I want to talk to her more about that. Uh, I also published part two of my two-part series on interceptive orthodontic treatment and sleep disordered breathing in the pediatric population. Uh, that was out in November in Orthotown. It created a bit of a stir on social media, uh, and uh, it was something that was well-received, but there was some questions as well that came up that I would love to, to talk a little bit more about as we start to dig deeper into why our profession seems to be somewhat resistant still to embrace this philosophy of how we can help these young patients with sleep disordered breathing. Uh, we're also going to take a little bit of time to dive deeper into the role and responsibility of the dentist and orthodontist regarding the diagnostic process surrounding airway compromise and sleep disordered breathing, more specifically, what signs and symptoms to look for in young patients. And we're going to kind of talk about some of the cases uh, that we've seen this in and how we've been able to help these patients uh, in our own practices to be able to overcome their issues uh, and, and really uh, the team approach that's needed to work together with our medical colleagues and, and just kind of how we coordinate that care. And I think that's something that's really starting to come more to the forefront is the need for the significant role that the dentist and orthodontist play in this process, but also working together with our medical colleagues to really be able to help these patients, which should be our ultimate goal. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Stacey Ochoa back to the podcast. Welcome back, Stacey. Thank you. Thank yeah, really you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for coming back. I'm so excited to do this. I should mention this is going to be a joint podcast again with our two podcasts, both publishing and producing this so that uh, both of our audiences, we do have some overlap, but there's some that uh, are unique to each of our audiences. So they'll get the benefit, the benefit of this. Um, so tell me a little bit about start out. Just tell me a little bit about the winds of change. I've heard great things about it. I heard you did an awesome job with, with your, with your lecture and presentation. So I, I'd love to hear more about it. Okay. So, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just very proud of my colleagues that put this together. So uh, the Winds of Change um, was put together by doctors Maz Moshiri, who's an orthodontist, and Reza Movahead, who mm -hmm. is an oral surgeon that has an emphasis on airway health. Okay. Um, and, you know, the Midwest, the people call us like the flyover state. So, you know, we're kind of the last for everything to start happening. It mm -hmm. seems like the coasts start mm -hmm. things and... And then we're kind of the last. And so um, Maz and Reza had reached out to me and said, look, we're putting something together in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about the importance of basically, you know, they had heard my message before of dentist triaging basically and um, identifying maybe at-risk patients that might need orthodontic interventions, okay. um, airway health. Uh, maybe they... Or CPAP intolerant, they're adults and they might need MMA surgery to open mm -hmm. their airway. So yep. send them to the oral surgeon. So I was ecstatic. So I, I just, I'm just so proud that that's happening. Mm. And the title Winds of Change um, says everything. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're all doing. Um, this is what we're all, we're all on the cusp of the amazing things that are coming and talking about what's what's happening in our practices yes. and how we can better more comprehensively help our patients yes um and really utilize our skills and i said this in in my um lecture was you know we are so educated as dental professionals beyond you know, the white things beyond the teeth. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if people really realize the amount of education that goes into mm -hmm. what we've... Prob probably most don't, yeah. Most don't understand mm -hmm. that. And and I mentioned that basically, you know, 
I get this phrase from Dr. Steve Carstensen, who's heavily involved with um, the ADA's movement and pediatric airway Mm -hmm. and moving that forward, but calling instead of general dentist, you know, we're really more of the primary care dentist Mm -hmm. and then deciding with our patients, you know, who do we need to refer to? Um, Mm -hmm. How do we intervene and who do we bring into the team? So just like a primary care physician does the same thing. We, we are doing the same thing with um, oral medicine. Yes. And um, when I, you know, golly, we had some big hitters at this conference. I mean, we had Maz Mashiri, Resimova had that put this together. We had Audrey Yoon mm. um, and we had Dave, Dave McCarty. He's a wow. sleep physician. Yes. Um, familiar. Yes. And he is just really, um, it's interesting because he, he pulled has me podcast. aside. He shared his podcast a while oh, back. Yes, actually. his podcast, yeah. Empowered really Sleep God. Apnea. Yeah, really Empowered God. Sleep yeah. Apnea. Yeah, it, he's very creative. Yeah. Um, I always jokingly say it to me, it's like I'm kind of dating myself here, but I don't know if you watched Reading Rainbow when you were a kid yep. with yep. LeVar Burton. Yep. It reminds me of Reading Rainbow. Yeah, like I could see that. He yep. takes you on a journey, but it's all yep. about airway sleep health and He's extremely progressive and integrative and um, really is partnering and collaborating with dentists and orthodontists um, and the things and he's really wanting medicine and dentistry to be on the same page. Mm-hmm. So I just really appreciate Dave McCarty, but um, he had said to me, Stacy, things are changing. You watch, it's coming, it's happening. Yeah. You know, yep. next year is going to be different, and you just watch. It's it, we're on the cusp yep. of the pendulum swinging, and it and it's coming. Yep. And so the fact that we had this discussion in St. Louis, Missouri, um, and I had the opportunity to listen to, you know, watch Audrey Yoon present all the things coming down um, with, you know, Stanford and the research and. Oh my goodness, she brought up um that they just received, I believe, a research grant for an ultrasound device that actually can detect where collapse is in the airway. Wow. Yes, it's ultrasound. So no radiation, wow. no need for dice. So dice is drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Mm-hmm. And right now that's kind of how we're seeing where collapse might mm-hmm. be. Sure. And then you've got the CBCT looking at different aspects, but yep. I mean, this was a this is an ultrasound technology, and it, it was pretty cool. But it's just what is coming, Mike, is yep. amazing. So part of my presentation, you know, is talking about the primary care dentist, the importance of collaboration with the ENT, the orthodontist, um, speech language pathologist, max, mm-hmm. you know, um, oral um, OMTs. Uh, oral surgeons, all of that, um, sleep physicians. But I wanted to talk about how is this new? You know, this mm-hmm. what you're hearing is oh, people are getting on the airway bandwagon. It's the new trend, yes, right, right? Right, right. Fad trend. It's way a to make fad. Money, way to you know, yeah, they're all treat more patients, handing right? everybody, and yeah. just yep. you know, and which is just not true. Um, we're not expanding everybody and no, um throwing not. devices that that is not the case we're just being more comprehensive and we and may looking. not even be expanding more people than the average orthodontist who does a lot of phase one and has no idea about airway to be completely yeah, honest really with you. good yeah. point yeah good we point. may be doing less because we actually really go through detailed diagnostics to determine the best patients to do this on um as opposed Agreed. to just like oh they look a little narrow they're a little crowded most orthodontists approach this from a solely, as you say, the white thing. Mechanical, right? the, 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 the white the things. Teeth. Like, look at all these, yeah. look at all these teeth in there. Ooh, I, I don't know if I can fit these. Let's expand. Without, I mean, I've had heated debates with colleagues who are pro phase one, who are pro interceptive treatment. In fact, in the community I practice in upstate New York, one of the practices that was most critical of my approach, it was a group practice. They were kind of pioneers in the upper lower expansion concept in the early 90s, well before that was in vogue. You know, I mean, that was really outside the lines to be doing that. Yet when they heard I was doing it with braces and wires and taking cone beams and looking at airway, 
you know, patients would come in for second opinions and, you know, people talk in a small town, especially, yes. and they'd be, oh, they're, you know, saying this, what you're doing doesn't work. And it's, I'm thinking, you know, 30 years ago, I gave them a lot of credit for like pushing the envelope and saying, we're not just going to extract four buys on every case, but maybe we can help these narrow patients grow. Um, it's, so it's not just, interestingly, I found pa- uh, orthodontists who are in this sort of dogmatic, mentality of no phase one that oppose this. I have orthodontic colleagues who are really in favor of phase one, who, as soon as you mention the A word and go airway, yeah, the A word, they're like, no, nope, nope. You that's, that's outside of our, of our, of our realm. So to the point of, you know, a couple of things I want, I want to touch on. Um, one is what you said about, is this new? Is this a fad, right? We've talked before in our previous podcasts about some of the things going back, um, you said that you, when we talked a little bit before this about uh, the Bogue reference, I don't know if you want to yeah. start with that and then I'll Yeah, kind of just it. something I showed, you know, I, I always like to, you know, kind of tease the audience a little bit and I mm-hmm. put up Bogue's reference of looking at the ease. Now, this is literally this article is primary dentition. Yep. I mean, it's all about primary dentition yep. and he shows the discrepancy between primary teeth with spacing primary teeth without spacing. And basically his take-home message is let us not um, minimize that small, what what appears to be a small discrepancy Mm -hmm. between spacing and no spacing, Mm -hmm. but get to the problem really of the why behind the change, Mm -hmm. which is really an etiology based and the fact that it will not correct itself. Right. And so let's not wait till they're older. Um, and then just deal with braces. Yep. And then my last slide is this was a paper from 1918. And mm-hmm. you can hear the audience just go, oh my God. You know, yep. like everybody's like, what? You know, yep. over it's not years new. Ago. It's not yep. new. And <clears throat> so I feel like we're not doing what is new is we have the technology that basically supports what our colleagues that we're standing on their shoulders. Mm-hmm. It just supports what they were saying. They just didn't have the technology and um, we're, we're just coming out with the research and technology that's like, oh, well, then this is why. And look at mm-hmm. these adenoids and look at, you know, um, but yeah, 1918. Yeah. And, and to that point, um, I want to read something from uh, 1928 from an article that Holtzman mm. put out. Uh, it's a take about a minute here to read, but I think it's really important and profound to your point. Um, there's a big thing that we face in this, and I'll come back to my some of the responses I received to my part two of my article, uh, which was called Expanding Your Reality, the article in Orthotown that talked about slow expansion versus rapid expansion versus doing it with braces and wires as I do it, and all of the, the, the biology of that, um, the chronology of that, timing it based on patient age and so forth. But can we get that article outside of OrthoTown? Yeah, I can put a link. We, I can give you a link for- Thank you. I'd yeah, love you to, right to put it. that yeah. in this. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you both part one and part two. Part one Thank goes you. into uh, just kind of the, 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 the first part of what we've been talking about, which is the need to diagnose and find the etiology. So part one goes into detail on that, has a lot of references of whether this is typically a tooth size problem or a jaw size problem. Uh, And then part two goes into a way to approach treating that with a couple of cases, showing how I treated it from start to finish with radiographs, slices of cone beams and and everything on on two different cases I treated. Um, And really gives a a brief overview. Obviously, it was limited in that type of forum on what I could provide. Um, But um, so Holtzman said, Some of the more common causes of irregularities in the temporary teeth are enlarged tonsils, hypertrophied adenoids, remember this is 1928, thumb and finger sucking, and faulty habits of tongue, lip, or cheek. Enlarged tonsils and adenoids prevent the normal action of breathing, with the result that the child's vitality is lowered and general development of the body is retarded. Any deficiency in vigor or growth is reflected in the positions of the teeth. The normal action of the tongue and cheeks, you're going to love this part, is in a great measure responsible for the shape of the arch, right? As you've called it, nature's expander. Nature's expander. Which I love, and I, I, I've i stolen from you. I'm sorry. I credit no, you with it. But I, <laughs> I'm sure I got it from somebody else too. So whoever I got that from, I don't remember. But um, When the mouth is closed, the tongue lies in the floor of the mouth 
and the force of the atmospheric pressure sucks the dorsum of the tongue against the hard palate. This flattens the roof of the mouth. As the teeth erupt, the pressure of the sides of the tongue pushes them outward until the force is equaled by the inward pressure of the lips and cheeks. If these forces are normal, the teeth will form perfect arches. When these forces are abnormal, the arches are either pressed into abnormal form or they are prevented from developing as they should. In such cases, the teeth are irregular, not from their own activity, but as a result of the forces acting on them. In conclusion, when one can diagnose an arrest or lack of development in the temporary arches, treatment should be instituted to stimulate growth of the maxilla or mandible to obtain space to accommodate the larger permanent teeth. It seems, therefore, that it is good practice to correct malocclusions of the deciduous teeth at any age, at any age when it may be done easily and painlessly, when by doing, when by so doing, you enhance the possibility of the permanent teeth erupting in normal positions. 1928. Oh so my gosh. Anybody who sits there and says that what we're doing, they label it as like orthotropics or I don't, what do you call Like I remember with my article, people were like calling it like orthotropics or different things. Or I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking. What are you labeling it as? What I'm doing is helping my patient in line with <laughs> science and biology. Like, I don't care what you call it. And I'm not into the name calling thing, but, and, and to that point, you don't have to do it if you don't want to do it, but which a uh, very great podcast um, that you uh, just had on with Courtney Levine uh, that I listened to, which was, oh, which was great. Um, and um, they really talked a lot about that side of it. And I thought you guys did an awesome job explaining like this isn't something every orthodontist has to want to do or do, but my gosh, stop trying to basically gaslight and say that this isn't a thing and has never been a thing. And it's kind of a new thing that this little cult group is doing to just generate revenue for their practice. It's false. And I'm not going to sit by and let that be how people like you and me and our colleagues who are passionate about this and know what it can do for our patients get labeled that way. Uh, this, I am so glad you read that. And that is, uh, it's super powerful and it's to the point and it's, true <laughs> it's right right it's fact it's fact right. so and this isn't like our opinion we, like in a why do you think in a hundred years we knew this a hundred years ago a few less than that but you know 95 years ago yeah we knew this why have how has it that fallen the, by the wayside and the opposite approach which is don't do this young prevailed you know, that's a really good question because, you know, it, it's when I, so I just did a workup on a four-year-old okay. um, last week and I'm, I'm doing basically an Invisalign workup on him. Yep. <clears throat> and um, I, the mom is completely on board and I, and I find that, you know, I just plant seeds. I talk to the parents. And she used to be a um, a CPAP. Uh, she used to work in the CPAP community. Wow! So she understands airway, and yep. she is like <clears throat> sees exactly what's happening in her son and knows yep. what his trajectory is. Yep. So she's like, and we'll do basically yeah, anything to uh, we'll do anything to avoid that going down that path. Yeah. Yes. So am I saying that? Uh, oh, my! You know, expansion and uprighting. Um, of his arches is is curing anything no but i'm a piece of this puzzle thank you for this right. child right and um i'm gonna give him a myo munchie i'm gonna help stimulate while he while we're doing some of this upwriting i'm gonna give him a myo munchie we're getting back to the ent this kid has had his adenoids out twice twice at four yeah oh and he's gosh. still mouth breathing so we are going to a uh they just moved from another state so 
um, again, maybe allergies, maybe new mm-hmm. allergies. Yeah, have we were hit. talking before in, in full yes. disclosure. I'm, my, I'm dying over here with allergies. And Mike, really, poor Mike. It's uh, yeah, but uh, I, I get it. The allergies can really yes. have an impact. And why aren't we, you know, g- kudos to you for recognizing that and getting him. But why are, you know, why are but most like, of us why? Not? So your question was like, what is going on? And I, I guess, you know, when I talk, when I get together with other people like us, you know, we're sitting around, you know, at courses and we all go to dinner afterwards, we have these conversations, what happened? And it's like, sometimes, you know, is it an agenda of um, organizations? Is it political? Is it, is it money? Is it, is it, it, it's faster to do it this kind of, um, you know, um, kind of, what am I trying to say? Like assembly line, you know, it's like the model doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fit the model. It doesn't fit the model. It fit like the model. How I did we that. come up yeah. with that model? You know, and it's like, I think one thing happens and then another thing happens yes. and it's a slippery slope. Yes. And then we get into this paradigm that we're in right now and this mindset and this model. And you get a few works. loud voices that come out against this, Tonke, Gianelli, you know, that there's no value. There is no benefit to interceptive treatment. I mean, again, those statements just... Ugh. Blow me away that you can, yeah. you can say that. Uh, but as we know, you know, lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can conduct a study to basically show whatever you want. I've exactly. had my masters, been involved in master's level research, uh, work with residents on their projects. I, I see what happens in the formulation of these ideas and these studies. They are constructed for certain purposes. And then you add in corporate money backing them and ulterior motives and wanting to get them published, right? And if the journal you're going to try to get them published in really doesn't agree with that approach, well, maybe you're not going to push that envelope. Um, you know, it's interesting as I look through the literature on this many, many times, I noticed just in literature in general, I found like in the 70s, even the 80s, you would see studies run by academic institutions, orthodontic residencies, say, and there would almost, not almost always, frequently be involvement from private practice orthodontists listed in those references, right? So you'd see, you know, five names, six names, and the first three or four would be, you know, maybe the first two or two would be faculty or director of a residency, maybe a couple residents after that, and then one or two private practice orthodontists who were participating in these studies. I rarely see that now, period. Actually, Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of American orthodontic residencies putting out a lot of good research into the AJO DO really at all anyway. There's very little. Uh, Most of it's coming from abroad. Um, So what are our residency programs doing that they are not bridging that gap between private practice and academia? And I think that's a big part of it because both need to be there. We need both. Both have profoundly important roles. But academia has kind of set this precedent that if it's not born out of research in academia that we say at this current time is valid, then it doesn't, it shouldn't exist clinically. And clinicians, private practice, wet finger orthodontists or or primary care providers who are doing the interceptive treatment, look at it and say, you're an ivory tower academician. You don't know what it's like to practice out there in the real world. You've never been in an office, seen 100 patients a day and understood what it really takes to do this efficiently and tried new things. You're still doing it the old way. So let's just break that down. What is the old way? Well, the old way clearly is is not what we think it is, which is four by extractions. And and that's what gets labeled as kind of the old way, right? Old school, like they're just going to pull teeth. No, that's not really old school. We knew 100 years ago that that really wasn't what we were supposed to be doing in every case, right? Not never, but rarely because as they have said multiple times, I have another reference I'll read from 1949 in a minute. But we've known for a while that that's not like like it, so that's not a new thing like that that um that we should be helping grow arches and develop arches what's happened is academia i feel because i'm yes. very involved in it doesn't get the opportunity to get these patients at 4 5 and 6 years old in an orthodontic residency in fact many orthodontic residents don't even treat a phase 1 while they're there many of them don't learn how to analyze cone beam many of them learn nothing about airway So academia has fallen down this path where they are myopic and they have blinders on and they won't look outside of their tunnel vision, okay? Then you get private clinicians who are all in the, 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 a lot of us are in that outside lane, right? And, And we're looking inward going, they don't get it. So basically, and this saddens me greatly as someone who's been through a lot of years of school and and is very involved and has been at teaching at every level of post-grad orthodontics and dentistry, it saddens me that 
there is this divide. And almost what residencies have become is this sort of get through it to get your degree and then you'll learn yeah. how to do it on the outside. You're, I mean, nowadays, orthodontic residencies, like uh, they're paying 50, 60 grand up to 100 grand a year paying, not getting paid. They're not getting the GME money that a lot of other residents get out there. M a large number of orthodontic residents are paying anywhere from, say, 30 to $100,000 a year for this education. They're going into tremendously deeper debt for this mm -hmm. just so they can learn things that they have to unlearn or relearn when they get out to do it in the quote unquote real world. So I really think we need to call for academia and private practice to start to get together. Now, last thing I'll say about that, and I want to hear your thoughts on it. Sorry to rambling on no, this. No, no, this is great. It, it brought up something in my mind too. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the last thing I'll mention with that is I think maybe I say, well, why did that happen? Why did there be there used to be all this research that was happening between private practice and academia? I don't know when the IRB really came about. I, I should have looked that up, but but the review boards and committees that review these studies. So as I've tried to work with residents over the years on certain studies to analyze some of my data and try to provide data to substantiate what I've been doing clinically, it's really hard to figure out how to merge my private practice, HIPAA. And and I mean, HIPAA was what, 90s, early? Yeah, 90s. 90s. So if you look at the literature, I bet, this is just kind of my own hypothesis, I bet from the time HIPAA came out, you're going to see a steady decline in the integration of academia and private practice from, a, from an educational research standpoint. And I think that's really, really, really mm. hurting the profession because it's making us not work together on these projects because just to get my patient database or my patient records into an institution, make sure they're safeguarded, make sure right. they're encrypted, um, make sure then who can access them. It logistically, it's not super easy to do. No. And so what happens? Clinics, clinicians, and private practice docs do what they do. Academicians do what they do. They spat and go back and forth on one another over who's right and who's wrong and who suffers the kids that don't get the treatment they deserve. Yeah, a hundred percent. There is, gosh, I'm going to have to find this. Um, my partner in ASAP, um, Tracy, Tracy Wynn, she posted this link on Facebook and it's this man talking about evidence-based and how he's just watching really intelligent people go into academia and then come out less intelligent than they came in because yeah. they're throwing out their brains. Yeah. They're throwing. And he said, really, where change comes from is not academia. It comes from the fringe. Yes. So he said, for instance, the light bulb never came from all the candle makers. Right. You know, right. candle makers didn't invent Great the light point. bulb. I love that. Yeah. So it came from the fringe. Right. So that's where change is going to come from. And right. gosh, if I can find that link, I'm going to throw it in this podcast too. But it, and then you need academia to take that great, fringe and investigate it. And investigate the fringe. To provide like what you were saying Audrey's doing at Stanford. Like you need to take the fringe and look at it and break it down. And that's not happening. Stacey, they're afraid to even, at some residencies, they're afraid to even use cone beam in evaluations of data for master's level research. I mean, uh, like- Why, why is that? It, I, dogma. Oh. Not the way we always did it. We use CEPHs. We analyze off of CEPHs. There's no standardization. Gosh, for cone what you can see off I, I mean, of a CBC it, thing is It just amazing. saddens me so much. It's like, talk about head in the sand. I had a podcast uh, just released yesterday, um, but by the time our podcast is released, it'll have been a few weeks. So mid-December was released with a, an embezzlement expert. And he talked, it's actually a great episode for any dental practice Ooh, owner, wow. employee about embezzlement. David Harris runs a company called Prosperident. He, he Amazing, fascinating guy. I mean, I could have talked to him for hours. Um, and one analogy he used is, you know, a lot of dentists, when it comes to this embezzlement stuff, like to stick their head in the sand. And he goes, the problem is, it's not any better when you pull your head out. And so I feel like that applies to what we're talking about as well. A lot of people are trying to kind of, stick their head in the sand when it comes to the airway side of things and yeah. hope it just kind of goes away, you know, give us enough, put enough arrows in our backs that we're just, you know, not going to take it. The thing is, I think now they've kind of self-selected for a pretty tough group of us <laughs> who, who are fighters and who aren't just, I don't really care about the arrows in my back, really. Right. Um, I'm going to keep fighting. And so um, it's going to take a lot more than that to, to stop me from getting this message out. I know you feel the same way as people like Audrey and Rebecca and people we've we, we've spoken about. So, uh, and tremendous credit to to Maz for putting that that forum together. And, and oh, uh, this, yeah. is, this is what has to happen. But I think we need to do... Um, 
I, I can honestly tell you that the, I've never seen a greater divide. I've been involved in academia either as a resident or as a, a faculty member uh, since oh, 20, going on 25 years. I've never seen a deeper divide between academia and clinical practice than I than I've seen today. It's just a shame. How can we be in 2023 and that's the case? Yeah. What were you you said you had another paper from yeah, was it the 40s? 49. So this is okay. really interesting. Um, this is 1949. Weber published an article titled, You're gonna like this one, Prophylactic Orthodontics. Okay. I love it. I love Prophylactic it. Prophylactic Orthodontics. And this was published in the AJO, which for those who aren't aware, the AJODO uh, was the AJO until I believe like the early 80s, it, it, it added the DO in. So same publication uh, as, as is the AJODO today. This was presented in partial fulfillment of the requirements for certification by the American Board of Orthodontics, read at the meeting of the American Association of Orthodontists in New York, New York, May 1949. Okay, so this was done as part of the requirement you had to do back then for board certification. And it was at the AAO meeting in May. So coming up on 75 years this May. Hmm. Um, the It talked about the fact that uh, colleagues often shun those who believe it's possible to prevent the development of a severe malocclusion by intercepting when the patient is young. So it acknowledged in this position paper that that there is this sort of stigma against orthodontists who are out there in 49 who are out there saying that you should be trying to treat patients when they're young and really? all, that's, all that's old is new again right here um, we are uh and uh it, it said that we should carefully consider the probable results of extracting primary or permanent teeth before we recommend the removal it's what you and i have been saying right diagnose What's the etiology? They've known this for a long time. We've known this. Our profession has known this for a long time. And went on to say, Weber went on to say, that extraction of a primary canine to relieve crowding in the permanent incisor region is, wait for it, rarely indicated. Said, and I quote, the complication that arises out of this procedure is one born of the short-sighted policy of extracting two teeth to make room for the eruption of one said we should instead be focused on breaking oral habits at the earliest time possible mm. including digit sucking and tongue thrusting so they were starting to understand even back then the role I mean, we read from Holtzman in 28, he had about the atmospheric pressure in the tongue. And we're just finding studies coming out now showing that maybe the reason adenoid hypertrophy returns in patients who have had an adenoidectomy with or without tonsillectomy, uh, and we have these recurrent adenoids growing, maybe has something to do with the atmospheric pressure and the fact that they're not getting that pressure to push that air through the nasal passageway into the nasopharynx, and that is preventing, that is allowing the adenoids allowing. to regrow. So they were talking about this 100, 100 years ago, and then the AAO, which will be the 75th anniversary of this, of this presentation coming up this May, who now seems to be, I don't want to say running away from, because I give them tremendous credit for right. they're having next year, the winter conference is going to be on this more topic of pedos and orthos together talking about interceptive treatment. I, I give them tremendous credit for that. I really, really do. I know it's hard when you're, I had Myron Guyman, the AO president on um, a little while ago on my podcast. And one of the things we talked about was it is hard when you're a governing body of this many voices Yes, yes. to, to really, number one, not upset some people. Number two, right. please everybody. And number three, stay within the confines of the law. They are re regulated pretty heavily by what they can and can't say. So I, I get that. And I get that change is slow. Uh, I think what's happened is, is there are some loud voices within that arena yes. who have really stolen the microphone. And I don't think, I think casting stones of the AAO to me is kind of short-sighted because the AAO, I mean, look, they were they were open to talking about this 75 That's years right. ago, right? Like, right. So I don't think it's like, oh, the AAO just isn't that. I, I think it's just leaders change over time and, and people that run committees and run the educational committees and determine who's going to speak at what what um, lectures and, and presentations uh, are going to be the ones that are there. 
things kind of go through phases. And right now we're in a phase coming, I feel, and I want you to talk yeah. more about this, coming out of a phase, because I really do feel like we are getting there, um, but kind of beating that door down. But they were in a phase where it was like, you know, again, the 90s articles by Tunke and Gianelli and these these really loud voices within the profession who were just like, no, interceptive treatment, bad, never really a place <laughs> for it. Um, it's just charging the patient twice. And, and, and those articles were put out quite a bit. With now, we're starting, you know, those voices have kind of faded down a little bit. And you're starting to see these newer voices uh, come up and say, no, wait a minute. There's there's a place for this. And, and we're going to get at it. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, right. What you just said. I have heard that, well, we might have to charge for two expanders. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes. you know, um, Tracy actually just put, uh, Tracy Wynn had a really good video on those that follow her on, um, okay, <laughs> they fo that follow her on Instagram. Uh, there is someone in around her that is beating the, I don't care about airway drum or whatever. Yep. Yep. And so she gets a lot of the patients from that office. Anyway, um, and you don't this have to say the name, uh, please, but is it ortho or, or ortho? Ortho. Okay. Right. Yeah. And uh, she has a video of basically kind of like, um, an, not an anatomage. It's it's not an anatomage. She names the uh, software that she uses, but it's mm -hmm. basically a, a rendering of her CBCT. It has the face and mm -hmm. all of it on there, and it shows this very retronathic child. And they just want to wait because they don't want it to be too expensive. I mean, just different things like that, mm -hmm. that the parents are like, please help my kid. So this kid's on CPAP. It's horrible. He needs class two correction. Um, he needs expansion. He mm -hmm. needs possibly, you know, here's the thing. He's on CPAP. So like what Tracy's point was, you know, I'm going to use protraction mask with this child, not to necessarily protract but to keep the mid face from being damaged further from yep. the CPAP. Yep. So the child is going to stay on CPAP because he needs it to breathe yep. while she's expanding, while she's advancing mm, the mandible. Interesting. Sure. Yeah. And so then she's using the protraction to keep, because the, those that aren't familiar with nasal CPAP, it looks like headgear. Mm -hmm. So it's a mask on the nose and a strap that goes behind the head. So it's, preventing growth of the maxilla yeah, it's tight it's got to have that it's pressure. tight it, it has, has to have the seal right yeah. so she's using and she's done this to get kids off cpap so they stay on either their autopap or cpap while she's expanding bringing mm -hmm. the jaw forward and then we can watch those pressures decrease mm. as the mandibles brought forward as there's transverse expansion and hopefully get the child off cpap or a minimal pressure mm -hmm. but she's minimizing the deformity that could happen from the sure. nasal CPAP. And even if she maintains where the patient's at, it's still positive. Exactly. It's a because it would have, mm -hmm. exactly. Yep. It's neutral, at least yep. airway neutral and not yep. airway negative. So, um, but um, we were just talking about, you know, I, I digress because uh, it, it's people are so worried about charging possibly twice for mm -hmm. an expander, worried about the parents' benefits. and Was that the only argument this orthodontist was making against it? I, I really don't know. Okay. Um, it, it There was something about finances mm -hmm. involved, and they didn't want it to be so expensive, and they were going to wait on things. Mm -hmm. um, and the parents were like, please help us. And I used this slide in my winds of change. I actually put up a slide. I have a little, a little bitty mm -hmm. three- or four-year-old that has a set of glasses on. And have you ever seen those little kids with glasses and they have the little strap because course, they're so yeah, they're sure. so little, their yep. little glasses yep. there, they're gonna yep. fall off. So they're walking around with their little strap on glasses. Yep. You would never hear an eye doctor say, well, let's wait till you're older to get right. you some glasses. Then I have another picture of a child with a hearing aid in and he's about three or four. And you would never, you know, so medicine true. doesn't do wallet biopsies on patients. Right. They they don't do wallet biopsies. They look at a child in need and ha that have sensory deficits and issues, and they say, "This child can't see. Yep. This child could have. This child can't hear. Right. You know, and and even you know, and, just, and we're just gonna just kind of wait on this. Watch. <laughs> wait. Yeah. Till they yeah. wait till they're done growing, so they need less hearing aids. Right. I mean. 
or right, that's such a less good point. glasses. Right, you don't want to have to pay for three sets, like four Gosh, sets. Gosh, why would we want you to have three sets of glasses? Let's right. wait till you're like your head's done. Maybe like right. let's get you a set when you're seven or eight. And where did that start in orthodontics? That like charging if you're doing something. I get it if you're doing nothing. And exactly, but I, I would actually contend that a lot of people who are just like putting pulling primary teeth and putting space maintainers in or doing all this sort of stuff. Um, they're almost overcharging in a sense. You could say, I'm not pointing to any one particular modality, but to say that that's okay, but then say that doing it maybe a little younger with a different modality is overcharging. It's like, wait a minute. So you're doing something the way you're doing it. And that's, that's fine. You know, you can do it your way and charge for space maintainers, whatever the case might be younger, if that's your approach. But if I go in and charge for my approach, I'm overcharging. And it, and it's like, look, we are doing something. We're not charging for nothing. Exactly. Exactly. We're charging for a procedure. Yep. And this procedure happens to be on a child that's younger and they might have it again. And you know, something too, you know, we don't know if this parent's gonna go get new and a new job with new benefits and new in- I don't have a crystal ball. All I know is there's a child in need in front of me. Yep. And supervised neglect is just not what I'm going to do. Right. I'm not going to sit and watch a child suffer. And we have too much research out with the ages of between four and six, knowing with the Karen Bonick study, the David Gazal study. I mean, the Karen Bonick study was 11,000 children. Mm-hmm. Yep. No PSGs. This was mouth breathing and snoring. And then the behavioral deficits, the behavioral changes. They watched 11,000 children between six months and 69 months old and then looked at them at four and seven years old Mm -hmm. and the behavioral issues they had. And it was like unprecedented. Like it's amazing Mm -hmm. research paper that is a wake up call to our profession of, you know, thank God for the primary care general dentists, because if the orthos do not want to see these kids at four, five, six, Mm -hmm. Thank God there are. So please don't, you know, get angry or throw arrows at a general dentist that is, you know, and you know, I don't But don't think, you think sorry, but don't you think that might be why they're throwing the arrows cuz they don't want to do it. And they it, it it part of it comes out of ignorance and it's that, you know, head in the sand, right? I just want to stay the way I do it. It works. I have my systems, my staff is trained a certain way. Because as I've said before, when I switch to doing this with braces and wires young versus doing expanders, and even when you do expanders versus extracting a lot of teeth young, it requires a totally different level of training and systematization and scheduling and inventorying. It's, it's, a, it's a change. And when you're a busy orthodontic practice, been doing it one way for a long time, and you're not directly seeing that you're harming the health long-term of your patients, you can easily put your head in the sand and remain ignorant and be like, I can't do anything about their breathing or their sleeping. You know, I'm the orthodontist. I treat the teeth. So- it's easy to remain ignorant, number one. And number two, they're fearful that someone else is yeah. going to do it. And if you if you, try, if you step back and think like the orthodontist would think, right? A lot of, as an orthodontist, we think we need to get that patient in our practice, right? So that they want to come to us when they're ready for treatment. Well, try to think for a second what happens if and when the primary care dentist, be it a GP or a pediatric dentist, starts treating that kid at three or four for some stuff. And we're not set up to do that. We don't really know how to do that. We definitely didn't learn it in our residencies. Now that's a threat to our entire profession. Now that's a threat to our patient base. We already have primary care dentists who are doing Invisalign and treating some of the adult patients that we treat, right? Now we have it on the other end where they're taking our pediatric patients and they're not sending them to us. And we start to say, I need to throw arrows to knock these this whole thing down because if i don't i'm in 10 years orthodontics will be obsolete instead of looking at it and saying why don't i start to think about what i don't know why don't i start to think about let me talk to these people let me see some of the cases they've treated right yes when yeah. i when i the, the online forums and the, the orthodontic study groups that some people were throwing some arrows um about my my uh cases i showed in that ortho town article you know what I find? What I said I didn't get in a back and forth sort of tit for tat because like, I was like it just doesn't it devolves on social media especially. It does. You know those conversations need to be had face to face. It doesn't work to do it on social media. So what I decided to say was instead of trying to go point for point on things, I said you know what I said it to both of them. I said 
I want you to tell me, you can label what I did however you want. You can mock it. You can say whatever you want. I want you to show me one, because they said I was cherry picking cases and I did explain like, you know, this is an article in, an, in a journal. I can't like two cases is as I had to push it to just get two cases in. <clears throat> and I thank uh, Chad Foster and Sam Middlestead at Orthotown for allowing me to put two in because uh, I know for them that that adds a lot more, more publication space. But um, what I try to explain is I could show you hundreds of these, right? I, and I could. And so I made an offer, set up a Zoom call with me. We'll sit down together. I'll take as long as you want. And I'll go through case by case by case by case of times I've done this exact same thing I showed in the article. And number two, you just show one case that started in a similar situation comparable to one of the patients I showed in that article that you treated to a superior outcome. Because in that article, I didn't just show the phase one. I actually showed one didn't even need phase two and one needed phase two. And it was like 12 months, very straightforward. I said, right. so show me a patient that started where those patients started at seven, that you did, you used your approach and got a superior result six, seven years later. W one, one, if you're going to, if you're going to make these claims, put your money where your mouth is, show me you're doing it better than me. Neither of them took me up on my offer. And I uh, offered for like one crickets. time, I, I literally, I said, I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do one better. We'll record the Zoom call and I'll publish it on this forum. <laughs> I love I'll it. publish it. <laughs> All you've got to do is bring me one case. And they just kept again, kind of throwing arrows, trying to, yeah. you know, and, and again, no one, I put that challenge out to anybody. Take some of these cases that we show and show that they did it better. And if you didn't, I'm not saying you need to do it the way I do it. Honestly, I am not. What I'm saying is, what are, ground are you standing on to mock the way that you or I do it, right? Like It's so it interesting that, it, it, it's funny, I love how you said, you know, we just all need to be open to how how we could be wrong. And and at when I was talking to David McIntosh, Dr. David McIntosh, he is an ENT out of Australia. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't want to be right I want to do it right. Yeah, I love that. And he said, I I want, I go into situations asking, how could I be wrong? Mm -hmm. How could I be wrong? And if we all did that approach, how mm -hmm. could I be wrong mm -hmm. and be open and listen to each other? And it's not about who's right. It's like, let's get it right. Let's get it right. Let's get it right. Yep. And I really like that. And that's what you were alluding to. And I, it's really interesting to me how, um, here's another pushback from some orthos I've heard. They're mm -hmm. like, just because you're intervening. Okay, great. Stacy. we're not saying don't send a kid at four to the ENT. That's not the issue. Mm -hmm. It's what they have issue with is that I am now putting Invisalign trays in a four-year-old and creating this broad arch, mm -hmm. um, at four. Mm -hmm. When they're like, that's really not doing anything. It's the right. ENT that's doing something. Right. Your uh, correcting the malocclusion isn't necessarily. We don't have any research saying that that's just, doing I anything. To I was just going to say, show me the studies that. Show me the studies for, that yeah, when you yeah, do that, yeah. the airway improves. Yeah, well, they haven't been done. So how? Show me exactly. The show me the studies. You know what I say to that? Show me the studies that show that it doesn't work. Yes. How about we flip this table back on them? Yes. Okay, you're going to be so quick to want studies that show it does work. You show me data that shows it doesn't work. Show me all the four-year-olds where it didn't work. <laughs> right, right. Because <laughs> you, you can't have it both ways. You don't get to say this doesn't work and there are no studies and then not do the studies or call for the studies. It, you could flip it 180 degrees. Again, and the converse of that just simply becomes, you prove to me it doesn't work. Because I have lots of cases. At least I have empirical data that it does, right? At, piece, at least I have anecdotal data, volumes of and it. And this is what I wanted. Does. Exactly. And this is what I've got to find this. This uh, He's an amazing, like he's a scientist. He's wonderful. Um, and just what he says of, you know, academia is not evidence-based. That mm -hmm. is not what evidence-based is not just nope. academia. It's not just it. If anything, it's a lot of times you come out of academia sometimes less intelligent than when you went in and you've lost some of your natural troubleshooting and yes. your logic. And, yes. and, uh, but it's a bit of a brainwashing it, in, in ways. Exactly. I mean, it, exactly. Yeah. And he said, anytime, you know, academia puts out a paper and everyone agrees and peer research, peer research papers sometimes are just 
basically everybody agreeing on one thing, yeah. which can be, yeah. is that necessarily the best thing either? So yeah. um, it, it's a very interesting talk that he gives. But, you know, when you you logically have to look at and anecdotally, empirically, the shape of this child's dental arches, I mean, he actually has crowding of his lower anteriors at four. Mm -hmm. Which we've known for a hundred years is, is which we know what, is what, not what should happen. Right? Even just straight, no right. spacing is a malocclusion. So right. he's beyond that. Right. So yeah. I am trying to this where I what I want to do is get the child back on track where he should be for his age. Right. That's right. what I'm trying to do. Right. And He's you're not expanding behind. to solve his airway problem. You're no. expanding because he has narrow arches. I'm expanding <laughs> because he had an airway problem. It caused him malocclusion. He has you. no room for his tongue. I'm trying to make room for his adult teeth, make room for the tongue, make that palate look more like the tongue print it should. It looks Got like it. a V. Yep. And I tr I'm trying to get the child back on track to where he should be for his age. He's behind craniofacially. And how does someone criticize that? I mean, truthfully, if it's your kid, like that's what I say to people too. If this is your kid and we can finish up in a couple of moments here with maybe a story or two about some of the kids' lives we, yeah. we, we were able to change. But if this is your kid, right? What would you really t say? Don't do anything. I don't think there's yeah. studies that say when they see, you know, I could give them some Invisalign or some braces that would, you know, really, it's only going to help. It's not going to hurt. I'm, I'm making room for the tongue, a better tongue. posture for the tongue. We might need to include some myofunctional therapy because we've had nasal disuse for so long. Yes. We, we've got muscle atrophy in places we shouldn't and hypertrophy in places yep. we shouldn't. So, so well said. So we, we got to get this kiddo. It's, it's like physical therapy for the craniofacial structures. Right. Uh, and uh, what Kevin Boyd uh, Dr. Kevin Boyd, pediatric dentist in Chicago, craniofacial um, respiratory complex is what he calls it. Okay. The CFRC, mm -hmm. craniofacial respiratory complex. Okay. And this is what we're trying to help. Yep. So, um, and like you said, if it's your kid, would you just sit by and just glasses, hearing aids, growth and development of the face, of the airway, the airway above the palate, the airway behind the soft palate. Right. And it's, my friend and colleague, Dr. Susan Maples, who I'm going to have her on next year I'm on a podcast. She has her own podcast called The Brave Parent. Boy, we're just plugging everybody. <laughs> um, but we need to plug each other because there's so to. much to hear. We have But to. she has a podcast called The Brave Parent. And I love, love, love. Oh, my gosh. Such a dynamic speaker. And she talks about um, she actually spoke at ASAP um, not too long ago. And the title was My Kid is Pooped. And what does their poop have to do with it? So she goes into the gut biome and the relationship between sleep health and airway health uh -huh. and the microbiome. But she says, there's no such thing as somebody else's child. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Mm -hmm. The second those kids walk in our door, yep. they're our responsibility as well. We are an adult in their life and we have to intervene if we see them struggling. And a medical Whether. provider at that. Yes. An adult and a medical, were there trusted, And a provider. Were yes. there trusted healthcare medical provider. dental healthcare provider? And two things on that. One is with the gut. I was listening to a podcast um, earlier this week, and it, it was a gastroenterologist talking about his training. And he is big on the gut microbiome. And as I think anybody out there listening who's health conscious or has started to understand, we can well beyond the scope of, of this episode to talk about why and, and our gut microbiomes are changing so much, but he's big on this. And he said, and, and I was listening, I literally rewound it and listened to it again. Cause I'm like, did he just say what I think he said? He said in his residency training, he took a two hour course, two hours, the entire time on nutrition and gut microbiome in his entire GI residency. Unbelievable. And I went, oh my gosh. And this was actually ironically, as I was driving over to, to teach it at the residency and I was in the car and I'm like, and I was going to be talking that day about airway and CBCT and all that. And I'm, and they don't get any of that outside of from me. And I'm going, oh my gosh, 
This is a fundamental problem between academia and clinical practice. Practical, it's practical not, edge. Yes. Right. It's not actually like ortho, dental. This is a problem in Period. all of medicine right now is the research is not keeping up with how quickly we're learning uh, in real life practice. And again, the, the need for the path of, of both of those. And then the other thing I, that triggered was uh, my last, uh, my, my last thing I'm going to read today um, is the, a, the ADA. So when we talk about practitioners who you'd mentioned, Tracy had someone who was critical of the way she was approaching it. Right. And they all, they kind of accuse us uh, it's thinly veiled, but uh, like almost malpractice, right? It's almost like you are doing things you shouldn't do because charging for a service that you shouldn't provide is malpractice. Um, you know, again, they're not coming out and saying it, although I guess some are, but they're basically, their point is, is that you're doing things you shouldn't be doing to these patients, right? The ADA, their position statement in 2017, yes. uh, titled The Role of Dentistry in the Treatment of Sleep-Related Breathing Disorders, or SRBDs, which encompasses adults and children. So I'm just going to highlight a couple points um, that deal more with, with the pediatric population. Um, but before that, they define sleep-related breathing disorders, which again, I, I'm big on getting into the sleep-disordered breathing over the OSA. I think when we go yes. OSA, we call in- we're, we're, It's to too this, small of a, a, of small. a niche. Yeah. 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 It's... And I'm big when I lecture, I talk a lot about the difference in those, but um, there are disorders characterized by disruptions in normal breathing patterns. SRBDs are potentially serious medical conditions caused by anatomical airway collapse and altered respiratory control mechanisms. Common SRBD these include snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, and obstructive sleep apnea. So again, OSA is just one part of these, this, yes. this bigger scope of breathing disorders. And then it will, goes on to say the dentist's role, this is the ADA is saying the yes. dentist's role in the treatment of SRBD includes the following. Dentists are encouraged to screen patients for SRDB as part of a comprehensive medical and dental history to recognize the symptoms such as daytime sleepiness, choking, snoring, or witness apneas. These patients should be referred as needed to the appropriate physicians for proper diagnosis. So right there, any dentist or orthodontist who isn't looking at their pediatric patients for these issues is technically out of line with the recommended guidelines. With the guidelines. Secondly, with the guidelines. In children, screening through history and clinical examination, history and clinical examination, something orthodontists tend to rush through um, that initial, initial evaluation, may identify signs and symptoms of deficient growth and development or other risk factors that may lead to airway issues. If risk for SRBD is determined, intervention through medical dental referral or evidence-based treatment which certainly expansion is well within evidence-based treatment, yes. may be appropriate to help treat the SRBD and or develop an optimal physiologic airway and breathing pattern. That's our ADA. That's our ADA in 2017. So I actually you said that at the winds of change. I brought those guidelines no up. No way. I did. Oh, I brought so up funny. the guidelines. Oh, that's um, crazy. You and I just are vibing <laughs> on this thing because I wanted them to understand this isn't my opinion. Right. These are the guidelines from the American Dental Association. I also show that the American Academy of Sleep Medicine discusses the role of dentist. Now, granted, it's for adult OSA, but we're talking about we're still talking about an anatomical issue. My my point was the AASM says dentists are needed to mm -hmm. collaborate with. Uh, for CPAP intolerant patients, mild to moderate apneic patients to stabilize that airway. Right. And I show a um, CEPH extracted from CBCTs from a, a, a nine-year-old to a 16-year-old to a 37-year-old, and they all have the same small dysfunctional, you know, yep. what are you going to do, right. right? Here we're doing CPAP. Here we're doing oral appliance therapy, mandibular advancement devices, yeah, surgery, and then a surgery. Surgery. Invasement surgery. We have the same surgery. problem right. in a nine-year-old. What yep. are you going to do? So right. then I show the ADA stand. Yep. What the ADA Brilliant. says. Brilliant. Now let's talk. Yep. So, I mean, this isn't, I mean, it, it really is the, the, the squeaky wheel I know gets the oil <clears> and you've got a few loud voices, but we just need to keep all doing what we're doing and yep. what we're seeing in our practices and doing the right thing for our patients and the and the research that is coming out is really very much in support of what yep. we're doing and yep. i think in 
you know, we're going to, what my, what my prayer is, is that our podcast, maybe Mike in um, two years, we'll have to find something else to talk about because it's so mainstream that we'll move on to something else, you know? And, but right now it's, it's educating um, dentists, orthodontists, medical colleagues. Yes. And I hope people take this podcast, share it to your patients. They deserve to know this is an option. I completely agree. Yes, they deserve. I think again, the dental ortho community, a lot of them don't want the patients to know this is an option. That's why they're so critical of it. That's why they mock it when a patient goes for an opinion with someone who we were saying Tracy's approach. And then that patient say goes to an orthodontist and the orthodontist just instantly is like, that's, there's no place for that. Right. It's right. Right. They, it's, they don't want it to be known because then maybe they're going to have to open their minds and eyes to doing it it's and, much change. Easier to just, and change and change and change is hard. So change is hard to close. Do you want to give me something and just a feel good story? And then I can give you one about. Yeah. Some, I, I've, like, I've had just, you know, again, these little kids, um, you know, just, I have a little girl, um, little Judith, and, um, she came to me at three and a half years old with a crossbite, you know, and you can see her chin's off centered and, um, it's a unilateral crossbite, um, poor sleep, um, her, uh, sleep questionnaire, the PSQ, she was tired. She's not healthy. Mm-hmm. She's not doing well. Um, we we had sent her to an ENT and they said, you know, we're not going to do anything with the adenoids and tonsils at this time. Um, keep an eye on some otitis media. But they're like, Stacy, you do you. You know, so um, I went ahead and corrected the malocclusion. I started right when she was four. So probably eight months in, we got her out of this crossbite. So now we, instead of her growing in this mm-hmm. unilateral, uneven TMJ health, you know, I made room for her tongue. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about proper swallow. And I mean, her PSQ, all her her uh, mom's like, she's doing so much better. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, we just see this every day, mm-hmm. all the time. And it's like, mom's stoked. Yeah. I mean, and these kids, they move so easy when they're oh, little. It's... They're like, we, you know, I think Mariana Evans <laughs> coined the phrase. They're so juicy. <laughs> yeah, really? It's they're just, juicy. It's just uh, so easy. They're so easy. And and it's like, you know, it's just, I just want to get them back on track. She had yeah. a hiccup with her growth and development. Let's, let's jump in. So yeah, she's doing so much better. And um, we see a lot of these little Judiths. I got another little kiddo. Like I said, he's four years old. We're getting started on him. Um, I'm not waiting. He, mm-hmm. He's, he's behind. Yep. He's he already got a malocclusion. Yep. So uh, I love to hear some of yours. Um, one that I, I tell sometimes when I lecture and on my website, I have some testimonials, um, that if you go to the website, uh, the ortho coach, there's, um, a testimonials tab and there are literally parents just, I literally just took my phone out and I just decided, I wish I did it earlier. It's one of those things. It's like, oh, oh I didn't think of this, and, but anyone listening out there who does this, do yourself a favor. And when you get a parent starting to rave or break down in tears or all these things that we see happen all the time, when you do this, just Good point. say, can I just take, is it okay if I just take my phone out and record this? Because I, I want to help other kids and other parents know about this and, and this'll, this'll help speak to them. So I started doing that later than I wish I had, but I would just be like, when a parent would raving, I'd be like, you know, can I just record that? And so I've got a bunch of those on, on my website, but one that, um, what is really interesting was it talks about the power of doing this differently. So uh, I had a patient come in and it was Halloween. It was yeah, it was six, seven years ago. And we had dressed up as different Disney characters and I was guest on and like, you know, I'm fully dressed. Like it's it, it, in my lecture, I show a picture of this. And so, you know, it's a fun, lighthearted day in the office, but very busy. And so I get a, over my ear from my TC, like, Hey, you know, Dr. Mike, can I talk to you? You got a spot I can say, sure. What's up? Uh, mom of the new patient is here and mom and dad and their mom is adamantly refusing us to take a cone beam. She says, there's no way she's going to do it. She said, she, this is her third opinion. She's already had x-rays taken and she refuses to have any more taken. Okay. I'm like, so, you know, and that, that happens sometimes, right? People, because when you do a cone beam and people had another opinion with a pan, sometimes they didn't even take a Ceph, but 
if they took a SEF, um, they, uh, you'd be surprised by the way, how many orthodontists don't take a SEF at part of the new records. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, very often. So, um, so they took a pan and, and or SEF or whatever it was. So my TC was been with me for a while. She knew how to handle this. She knew how to script it, the importance. So she'd already been through with mom. It's a low dose image. It's less radiation than the Panorex. It lets us see things like airway, such and such. Mom was tough, not budging, right? Not budging. So I'm in the middle of the clinic, still doing some stuff here and this in my ear. And, and I explained to my TC, you know, this is try this, try that. She comes back on. She's like, nope, mom refuses. She said she knows she needs upper and lower expanders. She's had two opinions on that already. Back to my point that even orthodontists who are into, into interested in doing yes. phase one disagree with the way I was approaching it. And she just wants to know what our price is going to be for the expanders. So I said, okay, put her in the consult room. So uh, I go, I walk in dressed as Gaston, I go in this room and I mean, mom looks at me like she wants, she, I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever had someone look at me with such disgust. <laughs> <laughs> like, who mom are you? Like, really? This is who's going to tell me you need to take x-ray on my kid? Dad's just sitting there looking at me. Kid is, Molly is the cutest little thing in the world. And she's just sitting there and I look at her face. Mm. And Stacy, you know the face I saw. Yeah. Right. It was maybe if you want, maybe I can send the pictures for yours. I'll put them up for mine. I'll just put her pictures up so you can see this kid's okay. initial malocclusion and face in our in the podcast. Dark allergic shiners, kind of like with my allergies right like now. Like you but, right now. <laughs> yeah. Like the Venus pooling and and just uh, open mouth. And mm. I look at her and I'm like, so I said to mom, I said, tell me a little bit about why you don't want, you know, I understand Missy has explained all this stuff about the x-ray and what questions do you have? Well, I don't see what the point of this is. This is ridiculous. You just want to do this so you can charge us more and so forth. And I said, okay, let me just explain a little bit. Let me ask you some questions. And I said, does Molly snore? And dad goes, yeah. Molly breathe through her mouth. Like she has her mouth open right now. Is that how she usually is? Yeah. She restless sleeper. So I started going through the questions. All of a sudden you start to see them going. And I'm like, I do things differently here. I said, I understand you've been told that she just needs expanders. I said, and I'm not saying she doesn't. I said, all I'm saying is I want to know why. And that 3D image of, for very low radiation is going to help me understand why. And, and if I need to send her to one of my medical colleagues, if there's something obstructing her breathing, I can't tell that from the 2D images that you have brought here um, from, from the other office. It was just a pan anyway. It was just, a, and I can't tell that. I said, so I, I have to tell you, if, if you won't let me take that image, I cannot treat her. I said, because I am big on treating the cause of things. And if I don't want to just treat the symptom of her crowded teeth. So I said, I'll let you think about it. You guys talk about it. We'll step out. I'll have my TC come back in a couple in a minute or two and, and see what you want to do. So I leave. And my, over my earpiece, Missy comes on and goes, um, they're taking the x-ray. So I said, okay, good. Stacy, this girl mm. couldn't breathe. She had complete obstruction of, of the nasal pharynx with the, I mean, 90% with the adenoids, huge tonsils. And I mean, and so I went back in the room and I showed them the 3d on the airway tour. I take all the patients on and I showed them. And I said, the first thing we're going to do is send her to the ENT and it's going to change her quality of life instantly. Instantly. Said, and then I'm going to go in and I'm not actually going to use expanders. I said, that's fine. I said, expanders would work. I said, but I have a way that I feel works better. And that's just going to be braces and wires. I said, and in fact, one really nice part about that is if you can't get in with the ENT for a while, because the ENT I worked with was way booked up. He was so good. And, um, and I said, we can still start the braces because ENTs don't love operating with a mouthful of expanders, that's but right. a mouthful of braces really doesn't make a difference to them. So we can start our part. And then whenever she gets the ENT, you know, she gets in for surgery, she can get in and do her, their thing. And we're going to have a, a different Molly on our hands when we're done with this. That family ended up referring like their whole neighborhood. I treated their, all their kids. And wow. I mean, it, that's not the point that I did it to like right. get them to refer everybody. But the point is, is. I stood out as somebody who did more for their daughter than just look at their daughter's teeth and become just a price. And I love that story because I got to watch this girl grow and, and develop and just change and transform. Um, and there's nothing like that, you know, and, and I, you're right. Oh, nothing gosh. Like it. And that, no. all, that, that ties it all in. It's the additional diagnostics. It's, it's understanding the etiology. It's working with our medical colleagues, right? I, if I, it, just my expansion, it wouldn't have been stable because a girl couldn't breathe. So she would have collapsed everything back. If yeah, it's it just band-aids. Yeah, yeah. And the relapse, it would have yeah, relapsed. Sure. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, that's, it's, it's fun. It's fun when you can do it this for your fun. patients. It's fun to, to do.
It's so rewarding. I had a little girl yesterday that um, I told dad we're probably going to be going in. Um, she was a hygiene check. Mm-hmm. And uh, so all my general dentists, primary care dentists are going to understand you know, we see these kiddos every six months and we watch them grow and I planted seeds. I remember mom and dad were a little bit, again, they look at you like you're crazy. Mm-hmm. And um, I got them to the ENT. So I got the little one. So she's three. I got her to the ENT. They did tonsils and adenoids. Big sister, I got them to take her too. They just did adenoids on sister. But dad was telling me yesterday, um, how much better her sleep is and mm-hmm. how much more calm she is mm-hmm. and focused. And, and, and this literally happened yesterday. Changed and I was life. actually changed her life. And as I, so I guess she is hearing dad talk. So okay. she's like three and a half, four years old. Yeah. And I have my hands down by her face. Cause I always do a head neck exam. I yep. always feel for lymph nodes and stuff like that. So I'm just feeling around while dad's talking very casually, you know, finishing my exam. And I'm telling him, you know, you know, we might need to go in and start some expansion on her because she's behind. She's yep. got some growth deficiencies because of that airway obstruction that we right. need we need to catch her up. So as I'm feeling around on her neck, I feel her grab my hand and she pulls my arm down and like kind of wraps it around her neck. And she was mumbling something. And I s- swoop down. I'm like, what are you saying? And she goes, my doctor, my doctor. And she was just hugging me. And I feel, oh, it was so sweet. I, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to just soak her up. Yeah. Gobble her up. Yeah. Gobble her up. And then she kept pulling me closer and closer. And her her dad goes, okay, honey. Okay. I think Dr. Ochoa needs to get to her next patient, but I couldn't help but wonder did she have some form of gratitude for what oh, I had done? A doubt. They know that int- intuitively they know you helped her. You, she knows that you yeah. made a difference in her, that you I mean, it can't was amazing. quantify it or know why, but she just knows that she didn't feel good before and she and feels, she good, feels now. good now. And because she was like, you. my doctor, my doctor. Yeah. And she kept holding me and I was Nothing like, like it. grateful. And I think she's hearing her dad and she's hearing conversation. You know what I think she felt? She felt I cared for her. Yeah. And yeah. she heard the conversation because people listen more when you talk about them. Ooh, than completely. To them. That's been shown. Yeah, completely. Yeah. So I'm yeah. talking about I think it's Jordan her. Peterson who talks about that. Too. Yes. Like if you want to praise your kids, it's one nice talk way to do about it. Them. Talk to your spouse about your child. About them. They're not sitting maybe right there or even if they are, but sometimes when they're like, you know, they can hear what yes. you're saying. Yeah. Yep. So I think she was, she was feeling that we were caring and loving on her yep. in that moment. So oh, this was so great wonderful. conversation. So this great. was wonderful. So great. So love talking with you and, and having these sessions. And I think it's uh, it's stuff that you and I'd be talking about anyway. And I just, that's one great yes. part about the technology is now we can just show people like, hey, there's people who think like, you know, people out there who think like us, just show them like, hey, look, that you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not alone. Those experiences you're having, the one I just described uh, and the one you just described, the ones you just described, others are having those and they don't feel there's any any voice for them. And you know what? Let's be that voice and let's be the ones who get up there and say, you know, no, 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 you're, you're doing it right. You're doing it right. Don't listen to the people who are saying you're not. You just keep doing what you're doing and and the tides are going are gonna to turn on this. Yes. And a rising tide raises all ships. You got it. Yep. So friend, let's keep talking. Same. Yes. Um, looking forward to our next conversation someday uh, and agreed. what we have to talk about. Things agreed. are changing keep, fast. The winds are, are changing. They, they are. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. And keep up the great work. Thanks, Mike. Awesome. Take care, Stacey. You too. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for watching this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to ADA SERP recognized CE courses or to schedule a private one-on-one coaching session with me. And remember to join the doc community on Facebook for more great content designed to help you succeed both personally and professionally. Just go to Facebook, search for the doc community and request admission into the group. You can also find doc on Instagram at at the ortho coach. And always remember, you have been blessed with the ability to do amazing things.